Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Plants Can't Tell the Difference, Understanding the Pros and Cons of Organic and Mineral Fertilizers. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. Inorganic fertilizers are often called synthetic, chemical, artificial, and many believe they're full of dangerous ingredients that are harmful to humans and the environment. This perception has driven many growers to choose organic fertilizers instead. And in turn, many of those growers view organic fertilizers as safer, cleaner, better for the environment. Some may believe that if the fertilizer is organic, they can label their plants organic too. But the truth is not so black and white. Today in this presentation, we're gonna be turning to Emerald Dan from the Emerald Harvest team to explain the scientific differences between the different types of fertilizers and the advantages and challenges of using each. Before we get going, just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A button. If you click that, that'll open the Q&A box. And as the presentation goes on, please feel free to type your questions for Emerald Dan and the Emerald Harvest team. And at the end of the presentation, we'll make sure to get to as many of them as possible. Also know that we are recording and we will be sending this presentation to all registrants, the video and the audio and the slides. And that'll come to your inbox in a couple of days. So keep an eye out for that. Now, with all that being said, I'm very pleased to welcome the one and only Emerald Dan. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan. I'm the communication and product consultant for Emerald Harvest. And I'm here with Cortland Erickson, our commercial sales associate with years of experience in grow room setup, fertigation, and hydroponic retail, in addition to professional growing experience. Thank you for joining us. In today's webinar, we're going to talk about organic and inorganic fertilizers. Ask most growers whether they prefer organic or inorganic fertilizer, and chances are you'll spark a lively debate. People have strong opinions about what's best for the food and medicine they consume, what's best for the planet, and what's best for their plants. The terminology around these fertilizers can be confusing too. Brands and growers throw around words like organic, natural, inorganic, chemical, synthetic, artificial, manufactured, all without drawing clear distinctions. Inorganic fertilizers, often lumped together as synthetic, chemical, or artificial, get a bad rap. Many believe their ingredients are harmful to humans and the environment, but are they? The truth isn't so black and white. And what if you could ask your plants the same question? In this webinar, I'll clear up the confusion. I'll explain why plants can't tell much of a difference between organic and inorganic fertilizers. Both are great for your plants, However, in tightly controlled hydroponic systems, inorganic fertilizers have particular benefits for plants and growers. I'll also touch on the scientific differences between these two categories of fertilizer, discuss the advantages and challenges of each a bit, and explain what, in terms of nutrients, is important to your plants. Uh, I'll start with a slightly embarrassing story about myself and my not so green thumb. When I joined the industry, I worked for a different nutrient company. This was a decade ago, more than a decade ago, and I was a complete novice, eager to try out my growers, uh, my, my employer's products. My wife and I had some window boxes. I selected my employer's organic line. I applied the base nutrient, and our surfinias, which you see here, started to grow. Wow, I thought this is great. I'll add some more nutrients and some more. I shared photos of my surfinias with my colleagues. I've doubled the application rates, I bragged. They warned me, do not do that. I ignored them. The surfinias grew and grew. As you can see, they exploded with growth, but they grew too much. Guess what happened next? That's right, they burned. They were colorful and beautiful. I was so proud of them. But at that point in my career, I didn't understand some basic things about fertilizers that I know now. In this case, I didn't understand that organic fertilizers don't take full effect right away. Their organic compounds break down over time, slowly releasing more and more essential plant nutrients. Technically, both organic and inorganic fertilizers contain chemicals the nutrients that plants and all other living things need to survive and thrive. However, because organic fertilizers are composed of complex compounds that need to be broken down, 
There's a delay between when you apply them to the roots and when the plant manages to take them up. My poor surfinias were doing great until the hardworking microbes in the growing medium converted all of the fertilizer I had applied. Suddenly, there was too much of a good thing, and my surfinias overfed died. Fertilizers should contain the right concentrations and precise ratios of essential nutrients, nothing more, nothing less. That's why it's crucial not to increase recommended application rates. Unless you're an experienced grower, unlike I was at the time, who knows what they're doing. These charts show the essential nutrients in cannabis leaves. Each nutrient is necessary, and even the slightest fluctuations in essential nutrients can make a difference, even tiny boron at the bottom there. To illustrate how much of a difference the wrong amount of a nutrient can make to a living being, let's step back to an unexpected place and time. Victorian London in the 19th century. The city was plagued by rampant poverty and squalor. British physicians were scratching their heads about two persistent problems among the poor, goiter and a closely related condition called cretinism, which involved intellectual challenges in addition to the thyroid swelling of goiter. Finally, Scientists discovered that an infinitesimal amount of a single essential element, essential to human life, was missing from poor city dwellers' diets. Iodine. When iodine was added to the London water supply and the water supplies of other major world cities at the time, goiter and cretinism vanished overnight. People need only an infinitesimal amount of iodine, micrograms of iodine, almost nothing. But without it, the whole organism suffers. It's the same with plants and their essential nutrients. Liebig's law of the minimum states that the amount and quality of plant growth is limited by the nutrient in the shortest supply, just like this barrel's maximum capacity will never be more than that of the shortest stave. Here's an example of what correcting the deficiency of just one nutrient boron can do for yields of various crops. So you had boron deficient fields and by applying boron, you got a massive increase in yields just from one single element that's almost not even present in the tissues of the plant. And here's what happens if plants are underfed or overfed boron. So you see there's this just slight window where you have the optimal rate. Overfeeding results in lower yields and also underfeeding. So it's not about it being more is better, but rather hitting the sweet spot with every nutrient. But to make it even more complicated, the essential nutrients also have antagonistic or synergistic relationships. For example, the right amount of potassium can help a plant get more iron. But if you feed it too much potassium, the plant might not be able to use all of the magnesium you've applied. All this demonstrates that in both professional grow rooms and in my window box, plants require the right amount of nutrients, no more and no less. So which class of fertilizer, organic or inorganic, ensures your crops get the right amounts? First, let's distinguish between them. Scientifically, organic fertilizers contain one or more essential plant nutrients along with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Inorganic fertilizers may also contain hydrogen and oxygen, and they will contain one or more essential mineral plant nutrients as well, but they won't have carbon. So that's the key. Note that inorganic fertilizers, like organic ones, can be made from natural sources, however. Rocks are natural, as are mineral salts, but they don't contain carbon. That's the key difference. Let's dive into the regulatory nomenclature a bit deeper here. Well, scientific and then regulatory. Inorganic fertilizers can be subcategorized. They do not necessarily all fall under the same umbrella. Mineral, a fertilizer that is either manufactured or sourced from natural materials such as rock or mineral salts. Aside from, nitro aside from nitrogenous fertilizers, fertilizers containing nitrogen, they are typically made of purified minerals. Note that these are not permitted under certified organic production because they are processed for plant absorption. Synthetic, 
So we usually talk, talk about inorganic fertilizers as synthetic fertilizers, but actually that's a subcategory. And it's fertilizers made of inorganic compounds that are usually derived from petroleum byproducts. And then there's true chemical fertilizers, truly artificial fertilizers that are produced industrially by humans through chemical reactions. The biggest difference is the processing each one undergoes. Each subcategory of inorganic fertilizer can feed your plants the essential nutrients they need. Your plants won't care if the nutrition comes from a processed salt or a petroleum byproduct, but you might care. The big argument against inorganics is that when they're misused, they can pollute the environment, resulting in nutrient runoff and waste, as well as disruption of soil matter and beneficial microbial life. And we'll touch on that a bit later. And that can be true, all the, and that can be true of outdoor growing, especially of intensive outdoor agriculture. You have the biggest problems with inorganics. But your hydroponic grow room is a controlled environment. In a hydroponic system, you don't have to worry about things like dumping excess nitrates or phosphates into the aquifer, nutrient runoff from the system, excess water consumption. In fact, on the contrary, use much less water heavy metal deposition. This is one of the reasons that hydroponic growers who are not seeking organic certification might choose to use inorganic fertilizers. Many of the drawbacks associated with inorganic fertilizers in intensive outdoor farming disappear in your indoor garden. Speaking of organic certifications though, let's talk more about that. Although researchers have found no consistent differences between the vitamin content of organic and conventional foods, I admit that my family and I do prefer organic produce. As you probably know, if you too choose to eat organic, the application of organic fertilizers alone does not necessarily equate to organic farming. When I pick up an organic apple at the grocery store, the farm that is selling it had to do a lot more than just apply USDA certified organic nutrients to its orchards it had to obtain certification, and it's more complex than just fertilizers. There are different classes of certification and different labels that go with each one. Here are the four USDA organic lab labeling categories. Note that not all of these can carry the USDA organic seal. 100% organic, it has the seal. All of its ingredients are organic. Or you can label your product organic with the seal, contains at least 95% organic ingredients, but up to 5% of non-organic ingredients, as long as they're permitted by the national list of allowed and prohibited substances, which has the exceptions. Made with organic, no seal, it can't bear the seal, has at least 70% organic ingredients. And then there's the organic ingredients category, which also has no seal, less than 70% organic ingredients. To get organic certification, growers must follow production methods approved by their country or state. I'm talking about the US here with the USDA organic seal, which falls under the National Organic Program, the NOP of the US Department of Agriculture, the USDA. It's the production process rather than the fertilizer that is usually the key to the certification. For crops, the, or the origin of the seed is the most important factor. The seed must be organically grown and cannot be the product of genetic engineering, for example, GMOs, gene editing. If you grew an unapproved seed with 100% organic fertilizer, the crop would still be ineligible for the organic label. However, if you are a grower who wants to produce an organically certified and labeled product and everything else is in order, you will most likely also need to have an approved organic fertilizer. While there are exceptions, as I mentioned, most inorganic fertilizers cannot be used, in, most inorganic fertilizers cannot be used in organic production. Those permitted are listed, as I said, in the national list of allowed and prohibited substances. So this is a clear example of when a grower would absolutely choose organic or inorganic fertilizers, if they're growing a product that requires it to get the certification. There's no way around that. Organic fertilizers contain the remains or byproducts of an organism. That's where they get the carbon 
such as animal waste or plant compost. For example, guano, worm castings, or humic acid. Inorganic fertilizers are mined from the earth. For example, a rock phosphate or a mineral salt like potash. There's also atmospheric nitrogen, which is used to create ammonia, methane, also used to create ammonia, and carbon dioxide, which is used to create urea. At the elemental level, plants can't tell the difference between organic and inorganic fertilizers. That's the point of this presentation. When a plant is fertilized with manure or compost, where nitrogen is still in its organic form, it is unavailable to the plant until it's converted into an ionic form, such as nitrate or ammonium. That's why it makes no sense to call inorganic fertilizer, inorganic fertilizer poisonous for containing nitrogen while considering nitrogen from organic matter beneficial. They need nitrates in the end anyway. The materials used to make organic fertilizers make them more attractive for the organic seal of approval, but plants don't care where they get their nutrients. They're, they uptake nutrients in the same chemical form, ionic form, whether the original source was worm castings or mined rock. On that note, let's talk more about ions. Organic compounds are complex. For example, organic nitrogen compounds, such as the amino acid on the left, consist of carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds from carbon to oxygen, and covalent bonds from carbon to nitrogen. Plants want to take up the nitrogen represented by the blue dots in the model, not to mention the white hydrogen and the red oxygen, but they cannot do so until the organic compound on the left is broken down, usually by microbes, into one of the nitrogen ions in the middle, nitrate or ammonium. Remember my surfinias? They were waiting for this process to happen. Meanwhile, the element nitrogen on the right needs to bond with one or more ele other elements and form an ion before it can enter the roots. When you feed plants an organic fertilizer, they get the ionic form they can take up directly. When you feed it an inorganic fertilizer, they get the ionic form on the right. Ions from inorganic fertilizers move swiftly to and through the roots and into the plant. There's no need for a microbial intermediary to break them down. That's the big benefit of inorganic fertilizers. They supply an essential nutrients to the plant in the form the plant needs. However, we can also see why organic fertilizers pay off when you're growing in soil. They contribute to soil health since the slow release of essential nutrients through mineralization, that's the process by which the microbes convert it into ionic form, means the plants can be fertilized throughout the different stages of the crop life cycle. If they're not overfed to crops, as I did with my surfinias, they also help prevent salt injury to crops, and they reduce the odds of losing nutrients to the environment through leaching, erosion, denitrification, and so on. So they produce less waste, especially grown outdoors. But that's irrelevant in hydroponics, where the roots have more or less direct access to the nutrient solution, which leads us to an enormous benefit of growing hydroponically. Even if you're growing in an open versus a closed system, you use at least 80% less water than you would use in traditional outdoor farming. This is the paradox because hydro means water, but hydroponics is vastly more water efficient than growing outdoors, where most of the water is not taken up by the plant and is lost. It leaves the system of the roots. And when you save water, you also conserve fertilizer. Note that on the chart, soilless means with growing medium of some kind, and nutrient means NFT or nutrient film technique, where the roots are in direct contact with pure nutrient solution. Thus, in hydroponics, there's also much less nutrient waste. Plants consume a strikingly higher percentage of the nutrients you feed them in hydroponics. Again, not so much goes off into the aquifer or runs off or gets locked up in the soil, which is precisely where the environmental harm happens with the outdoor growing with inorganic. Instead, it's more efficient. So in addition, when hydroponics use inorganic fertilizers, they also don't have to add microbial inoculants necessarily for nutrient conversion. You still might wanna do it for root health, but you don't need it for the conversion into ionic forms. Most inorganic fertilizers are water soluble and easily supply ions the form the roots take up so plants can absorb the essential nutrients in inorganic fertilizers immediately. 
And because you, not Mother Nature, control the environment in your hydroponic grow room, there's no benefit to the slow release of organic fertilizers in hydroponics. You don't have to condition the soil, none of those things. You feed your crops exactly the amount of nutrients they need right when they need them. The contribution of organic matter also impacts nutrient availability due to pH. Plants take up nutrients best within specific ranges. And if the pH is off, it can influence other growing conditions and yields. Well, what about inorganics? Don't we have some cons to list for them? I've been really singing the praises. Although I have been referring to the envir environmental harm of the overuse, and that's what we're gonna touch on. We certainly do have cons for inorganic fertilizer. This is a photo of a farm in Oklahoma in the early 1900s, and it's pretty shocking. The dust bowl in the American breadbasket was caused by many factors, one and a big one was the farming methods of the day, the stripped natural deposits of nutrients from the soil. They basically over farmed. So they depleted the soil of nutrients, plus there were weather problems and other factors. Part of the solution was inorganic fertilizers, AKA synthetics or artificial fertilizers, but they were created in the 19th century, but they really started getting used heavily then. And this created a cycle of dependency one study found that about a third of current annual nitrogen fertilizer applications made to corn in the U.S. is just to compensate for the long-term loss of soil fertility caused by soil erosion and organic matter loss. You can read about that in our white paper that we researched on the topic. A link will be available for you to download. The biggest problem with our inorganic fertilizer is that so much of it is required in outdoor farming, that so, you know, so much of it is required in outdoor farming that sourcing it and disposing of it, not to mention the nitrate and phosphate runoff caused by it results in the environmental harm. Indeed, almost all the drawbacks of inorganics are associated with this need to overfeed outdoors because it's not as efficient as hydroponics, for instance. In other words, inorganic fertilizers may be blamed for many ills simply because they're used more. However, hydroponics, as we've seen, uses significantly less fertilizer. Most of the drawbacks of, to inorganic fertilizers are applicable outdoors, but not indoors in your hydroponic growing system. As we've seen the benefits among other things of hydro is that much less water and nutrients are required to achieve the same or better results. There's less waste, less runoff, less fertilizer needs to be manufactured and applied. So there's less environmental harm. There's no need to overfeed in hydro. And so the drawbacks of inorganics are mitigated. Overfeeding, you say, well, isn't it always better to feed more? Here's an example of what overfeeding can do. The optimal application rate of phosphorus is reached quite soon, after which the number of flowers, nodes, and leaf sizes starts to drop precipitously. Each species is different, however, and has a different optimal range, but the same principle holds true for all crops. And here's potassium, same thing. Yep, too much K, lower yields. Growers should feed their crops the right concentrations and precise ratios of P and K and other essential nutrients to achieve optimal harvest. In a hydroponic system, it's easier for the grower to get that concentration and ratio right than it is with an, and for a combination of inorganic and organic fertilizer also is manageable. This beautiful forest is a clear example of the raw natural power of organic nutrients. A leaf falls from the tree above and it decays in the soil beneath the tree and continues the cycle of life. Fertilizer doesn't need to be applied to the forest. The forest ceaselessly recycles its organic matter into nutrients. The primary mechanisms of decay in this process are, as I've mentioned before, the, micro, the mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria living in the soil. It's the base of the soil food web. Beneficial microbes must be present in the rhizosphere for the organic nutrients to work. The, bene the beneficials break down organic nutrients, as I've mentioned. However, this is a time consuming pro process and it leaves organic matter behind. So it's not 100% efficient. And inorganic fertilizers, by contrast, don't create these types of problems in hydroponic systems either. So that leftover, that unprocessed stuff, as well as some of the byproducts of the microbial life can clog the lines. Organic fertilizers don't completely decompose and growers may have to fight stubborn repeated outbreaks, unaware that the nutrient solution is the source of infection. 
and they will need a line cleaner as a result, like our HydroClear to make sure everything runs smoothly. We created this product for growers who use organic or a mix of organic and inorganic fertilizers and hydro systems. Even though I've spent much of today talking about the complications organic fertilizers can bring to a hydroponic garden, and I don't mean to disparage them because I'm talking about hydroponics, not, fer not fertilizer use generally. Some of our products contain the, be the best of both worlds. Take, for example, King Cola, our Bloom Booster. It's categorized as inorganic, although it does include hemp seed flour, for instance. So we like to combine the best of both approaches and have very finely strained organic materials in the products. Likewise, our premium plant tonic Emerald Goddess uses the best ingredients for the job, organic materials such as kelp and alfalfa alongside premium inorganic materials. It's a mix designed to bring out the best of the plant while still running clean. We often say that the goddess is as good as organic. I hope I've persuaded that you that unless you're certified organic, there's no need to swear off inorganic fertilizers. Your plants can't tell the difference between high quality inorganic and organic fertilizers. They must take up nutrients in the form they need them, ions. There's no getting around it. The big difference is in convenience and efficiency for you, the grower. That's why Emerald Harvest offers a complete line of nutrients made from high quality raw materials, formulated in precise concentrations and ratios your plants need to maximize their genetic potential. To be fair, many brands, not only Emerald Harvest, combine high quality inorganic minerals and organic compounds to fill in dietary gaps and provide additional benefits that organics bring. It's the nutrient approach we recommend, actually. Thanks for listening. Please remember to watch for the link to the white paper from Emerald Harvest on organic and inorganic fertilizers. It goes into more depth, including about heavy metals, which are a concern. If you enjoyed this webinar, I think you'll find it interesting. And now, uh, just in a few minutes, I'm ready to field your questions or Court, who is uh, much more experienced, as you can see from my experience with Serfinias than I. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. And yes, we have Cortland Erickson from Emerald Harvest here as well as we get into the Q&A section. I know a few folks have, uh, you know, raised their digital hand, so to speak, um, but for lack of uh, audio capabilities in the audience, uh, if you could just, if you haven't yet, uh, please add your questions to the, the Q&A box in text form. And, and then one quick note, just as Dan mentioned, um, Emerald Harvest is sharing their exclusive white paper uh, with the CBT audience that's up on the Cannabis Business Times homepage. If you were to go to CannabisBusinessTimes.com, you'll see that white paper off on the right side of the screen. So it sort of builds off, off the presentation there. Um, at any rate, let's begin with some Q&A here. Um, Dan, could you talk a bit about uh, the balance between um, fertilizer use and water use? And one of the questions being uh, whether organics end up using more water overall. I'm going to throw that question to Cortland. Are you there, Court? I would yeah. assume they do. They even absorb water, right? The organic matter. Yeah, the organic matter should absorb some more water. Um, I guess, I mean, it kind of depends on the root mass, size of the pots. Um, usually when you find hydroponics, you're going to find a smaller root mass. So therefore, absorption of water will be a little less. Um, I don't know, is there anything more you can add to that, Dan? No, but I mean, that's the efficiency of it as well. The roots don't need to expand as much because they don't need to seek out the nutrients. The nutrients are constantly washing past them, especially in a recirculating system. So that's why it's much more efficient in terms of both water and nutrients. And that's even true if you're running organics through a hydroponic system. That's about hydroponics uh, itself as a system. Yeah, on a, on a similar note, um, could you maybe talk about um, any benefits that may relate to fungal interactions uh, with the plant when using organics? Court? Um, yeah, I mean, with hydroponics, you're of course gonna have a cleaner background. Everything's uh, filtered and purified and cleaned before it goes into the bottles. So you're gonna have less bacteria and less uh, pathogens that are, are present uh, little to none so although just, i think oh go ahead 
no, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there would be, there is a benefit for organics as a source of food for beneficial bacteria. So like if you're using a microbial inoculant, that's actually one of the reasons why we recommend a mixed fertilizer line that has organic elements in addition to a carbohydrate supplement, because you have to, so you'll have better colonies established of beneficial microbes, if that's what was being asked. You have to have an organic source for them to eat. It could even just be sugars, which is organic. It has carbon in it, carbohydrate. Um, relating to uh, hydroponics, could you discuss a bit about either what can be done with wastewater from hydroponics or maybe uh, an amount of wastewater to expect? Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, regarding like hydroponic systems and indoor growing, there's going to be a lot of pipes and a lot of uh, you know emitters and filters and whatnot, and, and having them go through these types of systems, being in an inorganic, it's a lot cleaner, and therefore when you are reclaiming your your hydroponic nutrients, it's a lot easier to clean, a lot less labor. Um, so you know, a lot of these larger indoor facilities are reclaiming their hydroponic wastewater and it is a lot easier to clean inorganic material than it is organic material. Mm -hmm. um, this question came up uh, a little while ago during your presentation, Dan. Um, could you elaborate on salt injury to crops and maybe what that, what that term might mean and, and how, to, how to approach it? I'm going to throw that at Cortland too, but it's the buildup in the system, right? It's from yeah. overfeeding, essentially. Yeah, basically overfeeding, too much salt, higher ECs, higher PPMs collect. When uh, you have that little bit of organic background in there, the plants can pull what they need. Um, I mean, it all comes down to purity rates in your, in your, in your minerals and your hydroponic nutrients as well. Um, Know, emerald harvest being at like a 90% purity rate, you're going to have a cleaner background of fertilizer. So your parts per million and your ECs will be a lot lower than most. So it's a cleaner environment. Uh, are there any um, physical signals or manifestations to keep an eye out for with a bit of overfeeding and, and the salt injury, so to speak? Uh, usually burning of the leaves, necrosis towards the bottom of the plant, uh, purpling of the stalks and stems. Um, you know, it's always good to check your runoff at least once a week. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's important to note as well that what I did, what I described at the beginning was also essentially an overfeeding salt injury. So once, once the compounds are converted into ionic form, regardless of their origin, that can occur. But it's easier if you overfeed with the inorganic, but it's also immediate. Um, we've gotten a couple of follow-up questions, so I don't want to get too all over the map here. But just going back to that question about wastewater and the hydro environment, can you reincorporate that water, the runoff, into the original tank? And will, will you need to put in some hydrogen peroxide to prevent any bacteria development? Most of the time, you can add it straight back to the tank. Right? depends on how clean your system is and what type of maintenance you're doing on your system. So it all comes down to maintenance and SOPs. Um, next question here, uh, is ammonia produced from methane the best source of inorganic nitrogen? Unsure about that actually. I'm not, I'm not sure what the best source is. But the ammonia is converted into ammonium when it's mixed in the nutrient solution. And it's the ammonium that the plant needs. So there is this conversion happening, but it's a chemical reaction as opposed to a biological process that we described with the organics. But I don't know about in terms of manufacture, what the best method is. Gotcha. Um, just in a general sense, um, could you maybe discuss any of your thoughts regarding pre-mixed nutrients versus salts that are maybe mixed on site? Court? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely cuts back on labor. Uh, usually salts require a lot of mixing and uh, extra attention. Um, 
salts, you know, usually when you're getting them in the raw form, their purity rate is not that high. So your ECs and parts per million are going to be a lot higher. Um, there also could be an imbalance in some of those small um, micronutrients um, and macronutrients, considering, you know, boron, you don't need very much of it. And when you're trying to disperse a tiny grain of salt over a large bag of, of minerals, um, you could be cutting out from reservoir to reservoir on the appropriate amount of minerals. And boron is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world and has this incredibly tight range of optimal range. So overfeeding and underfeeding, it's very easy. Um, it's, it's rarely recognized, however. Um, we have a question here that, that did come in earlier in the presentation as well. Um, would it be necessary to add microbes when using an inert media and a liquid fertilizer? Um, and in this case, the, the inert media may have mycorrhizae in it. Sort of a more specific question there. Yeah, I mean, it's completely beneficial. It's going to help break down the organic. It's still able to do its job in, in, in organic media, um, rock wool, uh, pro mix. You know. So yeah, it's completely beneficial. Next question here is, um, is there any uh, scientific research done into whether inorganic nutrients may leave behind um, some sort of residue in the finished flower? Um, that's just quoting the, the question here. I don't know if that person would like yeah, to elaborate. No, I mean, yeah. we, we covered that base when writing the white paper. Mm -hmm. So I, I work with a colleague, uh, a PhD, a microbiologist, um, and we also have microchemists on our team, and they scoured the literature. And that's mostly... It, appear, it appears, no, it appears to be pretty much an urban myth about it. So um, there's very little content. You'll see it in the white paper, but there's very little content in terms of nutrient content and vitamin content between organically grown produce. Uh, nothing's been done on cannabis that we know of, but it should, the same principles that apply to, you know, edible produce should apply to cannabis. There are slight differences in, for instance, nitrogen levels. You'll see that in the white paper, but they're not as great as what people assume. So this cheminess, perhaps, that could be produced by inorganic fertilizers, um, it's possible because there's slight nutritional differences between organically sourced and organically sourced, but they're not large differences. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I know uh, my colleague dropped the direct link for that white paper in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to check that out. Um, got a question here um, about how the both of you may feel about using living soil in a greenhouse setting uh, with the grow beds in a flood tray to catch runoff and to drain into a circular closed system so that the water could be filtered and recycled to leave a smaller carbon footprint. Um, so in that case, living soil in a greenhouse setting with the grow beds in a flood tray would you recommend organic feeding or more of a combination? I know it's a pretty specific question, but let me know if I can clarify. I'd say more of a combination just uh, to get that push from your hydroponics. But I mean, like I said, it kind of depends on the product you're going for. If you're going for that all living soil, all organic product, then I wouldn't push the inorganic with it. So little inorganic fertilizers required in indoor growing that it's not that impactful. But it, that, that question made me think of a dream that my wife and I had, which was to have actually to have a permaculture garden around a home someday, but also have a hydroponic indoor grow. And to use, for instance, like aquaponic as a source of fertilizers, that would be an organic system, but a hydroponic system, but more of an open system that circulates through the garden. I like the idea of filtering as well. Um, naturally. So I'm into all that stuff, actually. I'm not uh, opposed in any way to organic. We're really into it in our family. That's what it made me think of. It's an interesting idea to integrate into those plans of ours. Um, we've got a question here just relating to perhaps more of a, uh, a subjective arena, but um, could you maybe elaborate on organic versus inorganic with regard to the taste of cannabis flower in this case? I mean, when it comes to organic, I feel like you're definitely going to have more of that resinous uh, background 
to it, you're going to have more terpenes. Um, yeah, with, with inorganic, if you're not pushing certain organics or, um, you know, terpene builders behind that, which a lot of that work comes from the background of the microorganisms, um, I feel you, you end up with more of a drier, not as sticky end product, which is where you get a lot of your terpenes and taste from. There, there was that part of the presentation where we touched on filling in the gaps so um, even though it's kind of paradoxical because vitamin supplements are actually more mineral supplements on top of normal food, you could think of this uh, mixed approach of having a primarily inorganic lime, but with a lot of organic or natural elements included in it as like filling in the gaps, much like you would, you know, vitamin supplementation. So it provides ready-made compounds. Again, this is very controversial in the science. Can the root take up an amino acid, can the root actually take up a carbohydrate without converting into organic form? And there is actually a process by which larger compounds can be taken into the plant. And we have a theory, but it's very controversial in science that feeding a certain amount of organic elements to your crops is providing them with ready-made materials that they would otherwise have to produce themselves, if that makes sense. So you're kind of saving the plant energy. It's why we include hemp seed flour in the product, because it's actually the same organic material that cannabis plants will have to produce themselves. Uh, much like I described the natural forest working, where the forest decomposes and then it grows out of its own matter, essentially. So we do think there's a benefit we think there's, a, there's an efficiency benefit for the inorganic element. So the, the, way to, the better way to regulate your pH, your PPMs and control the nutrition of the plant. So you guarantee that you don't overfeed or underfeed and a cleaner system, but there's a benefit and possibly including in the quality of the end product, which was the question of sort of filling in the gaps as we put it with organic elements. They're gonna provide a sort of richness and more complex compounds than simply the ions. And at the very least, they feed the beneficial microbes, produce a more vibrant colony, and even beneficial microbes like bacteria, they have effect, for instance, on phytohormone production in the upper plant. And that phytohormone production is going to increase yields and quality of the end product as well. Yeah, if I could maybe have uh, either of you guys maybe elaborate a bit more, we just have sort of a flurry of, uh, of follow-up questions there, specifically yeah. relating to terpene production and, and why... Um, why organic might produce more terpenes and, and maybe if you could dig in a bit more on uh, whether it's specific terpenes or specific terpene profiles that might be drawn out uh, to use the word from earlier in the presentation synergistically um, whether there are certain compounds that might correlate to certain terpene profiles if that makes sense i don't know you know this is very um there isn't a lot of empirical evidence around this right and uh and some of the best research into cannabis is being done, including terpene production in Israel, um, because they've really allowed the research for longer. So it's been very short period of time since prohibition started easing. And so it's one of the most understudied crops, you know, and these relationships are very unclear. But like I mentioned before, it might have something to do less with the organics than with the sort of mycorrhizal and beneficial bacteria, mycorrhizae and beneficial bacteria in the rhizosphere triggering increased phytohormone production, stimulating the upper part of the plant, for instance. But this, it's very speculative. Well, yeah, certainly a, an area to, to keep an eye on as far as the research side of things. Um, we've got another sort of, uh, I guess, more specific question here, but I wanted to pose this. Um, we have a grower using cocoa core indoors, adding worm castings and organic nutrients at week two. Uh, so from there, when is the best time to add nutrients and, and should this grower be using full strength or, or increasing over time? I mean, I guess it depends on the size of the plant um, and how much organic fertilizer and stuff that you've been using. Around week two, if you've been transplanted, you know, at the beginning of flower, you should see some depletion in nutrients. So I would start off kind of slow and work my way up towards mid flower to full strength. So, yeah. Um, we've got a, a question here, um, shifting gears a little bit to aeroponics and, and even 
fog tonics mentioned, uh, what would be, um, well, can, can these products be used in that environment, first of all? And then from there, uh, do you have any specs on like droplet size uh, for the nutrients, things like that in, in, a, in an aeroponic environment? In an aeroponic environment, you're probably gonna wanna dial back to about half strength of our nutrient line. Um, mm -hmm. So you're probably falling around at the max PPMs, somewhere around 800 parts per million. In mid bloom. Um, yeah, massive. Mm -hmm. It has the highest nutrient efficiency and also water efficiency. The next question here just being um, are there specific contaminants that are maybe more often associated with, with organic nutrient sources? Um, any that sort of come to mind, I guess, being accompanied to organics? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, lithium probably being the biggest, but um, yeah, I'd say lithium. It's just the whole problem of having organic matter, right? So if you have a if you have sufficient microbial colonies, beneficial microbes, if you've established them well, they're going to have first mover advantage. They're going to establish strong colonies, and they're not only going to benefit the roots and help to convert organic. Um, material into ionic forms, but they're also going to increase the health of the roots. And they actually do that by keeping harmful bacteria away. So um, really what happened, a lot of these problems that are developing are from an excess of organic matter in the system that has not been processed by beneficial microbes. So this sort of unused waste floating around can attract harmful microbes, and then you can have outbreaks, at least in the root system. Um, we've got a question here relating to coconut fibers, again, sort of similar to what was asked earlier. Um, uh, what kind of fertilizers might be best in the irrigation water in a coconut fiber media? That's for you, for sure. Uh, of course, just hydroponic fertilizers in general. Uh, you know, when it comes to putting some organics into the nutrient line, of course, it's going to require more maintenance on the system. So um, I prefer the best of both worlds. You got an organic and an organic mixture. It seems to bring out a better product. So, um, yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about um, more of a, an outdoor environment when growing in, in pots? Uh, can this line of products be used in that, in that sort of environment? Yeah, of, of course it can be used in larger potted systems. You're gonna wanna do more of a feed water water when it comes to larger pots and, and outdoor. Um, could you talk a bit about uh, whether the benefits of salt-based nutrients apply when using living soil? I mean, at times it could probably be a little much considering the living soil is building its own background there, but you know, the push, a little push from some extra minerals won't hurt. It's about the moderation again, you know, the, um, the whole problem with intensive outdoor industrial agriculture, it's actually that there's so much use of the inorganic fertilizers that they're actually causing harm, for instance, the microbial life in the soil. That, that's what I meant by dependence. So the soil in the Midwest is heavily dependent on a constant application of phosphates and nitrates. Otherwise the soil is really without any, it is, I'm not saying it's absent natural soil life, but it's very weak. It's very fragile soil. It could easily revert back to the problems we saw in the early part of last century. So I would watch out for that with living soil as well, that, you would want to not, like, like Court just said, not to over fertilize to the point of being harmful or toxic to the life in the soil. That's the big risk of the inorganic approach. So the more, the more your, the more your, uh, the more your approach resembles outdoor agriculture, the more the benefits of organic outweigh the benefits of inorganic. The, the closer they go toward a pure hydroponic system, like for instance, aeroponics, I would say that you get much more weighted toward the inorganic because of the problems you have in the lines and also just the, that you can control the system perfectly. Um, we have a question here that 
you know, in many ways wraps around to the beginning of, of your presentation, Dan. Um, just someone who's been working in the cannabis industry uh, on more of the, the research side and the plant biology side, um, running into problems with, with the terminology as you started this, the organic versus synthetic, organic versus artificial, what have you. Yes. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on maybe what individual growers might be able to do, you know, whatever, whatever products they're using to, to straighten out um, some of those definitions or to even normalize certain terms or, or maybe what your own personal opinion is? Yeah, no, that's, that's a tough question. Like I can think about it from a marketing standpoint that what we try to do, for instance, is we try to use the correct terminology within the company. And it's very even, it's, it's even hard to align there because there's colloquial usages. Like people talk about synthetics all the time. Um, it's also very hard if you're to evaluate looking at a bottle, it's impossible unless you, if you know what the sourcing of the company is, like where, what kind of, whether they're getting a chemi which which elements inside a fertilizer are chemically sourced, syn truly synthetic source from petroleum products or mineral, but um, yeah. What we, what we would like to hear though, we, we, what we would like is if people didn't perceive the inorganic as something unnatural like Frankenstein compounds. Like our point in this presentation is that the plant really needs ionic compounds. And if you want to minimize the potential damage done by the inorganics, all of them, you simply you know, grow the, use them primarily in hydroponics. You don't overfeed your crops. Um, you know. And but the, but it we want to dispel some of the myths that they are inherently harmful because your plant at the root level is taking up basically inorganic fertilizer, but the benefits of the organic have more to do with the soil conditioning, less runoff. You know it has to do with environmental conservation, and uh, I don't buy so much that it has to do with human health, for instance. So we choose personally as a family, I mentioned organic produce, but we do that for environmental reasons. We don't believe, it's very unscientific actually to believe that an organic that's produced in intensive outdoor agriculture, an organic, inorganic apple is somehow harmful. So if that makes any sense, like what we would like to normalize is people's thinking about, about it in a chemical sense, that there are some drawbacks to inorganic fertilizers from their overuse that is the envi potential environmental harm caused by intensive agriculture, outdoors dumping huge amount of phosphates and so, uh, but it's not about somehow the mineral fertilizers or even the synthetic and chemical fertilizers poisoning your plants or harming your food. Like that's, that's a myth. And that's what we would like to normalize is that sort of thinking. Focusing on minimizing the impact of our farming on the environment, but not viewing one type of fertilizer is somehow pure and good for you and another kind is harmful because at the root level, they're the same. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? I think it touches on a lot of the, the points that that person was, was raising in their question, yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's certainly, as, as you mentioned, it go into some, some depth in the white paper, would point people in that direction. Um, and I think it addresses some of the ongoing concerns. I mean, there's a big, there's yeah. a whole bunch of terminology debates going on in cannabis right now. Yeah. Not on the fertilizer side. Um, just as one last question here, uh, we do have someone asking what parts per million of boron would you recommend? And I wanted to just add to that um, whether whether we should be thinking about these as fixed numbers or um, how you might approach a, a PPM recommendation given the the synergistic chart you had earlier in the presentation. That's something for the scientists. I mean, uh, we make a joke, I think, in, in one of our presentations that you can go ahead and try to do it yourself if you have a horticultural degree, but otherwise, um, yeah, I can't say what goes into the specific formulations. I'm not even privy to our formulas because they're proprietary. Like, Court, can you answer that at all? Yeah, I mean, they're proprietary, but you can go onto our website and look at our uh, GAs. Yeah, you can look at the nutrients and it'll give you the levels of everything that's in our base nutrients. And as far as, as far as determining a good formulation, it has to be done through just massive test growth. So first laboratory formulation 
And so a, a chemist actually analyzing the reactions and what sort of impact increasing the phosphorus will have on the boron, then having to adjust the boron. And they just have to go through repeated modeling processes, essentially, through chemical formulas. But then you have to test it in the field and have different formulas tested on different crops and look at the, look at the consequences. You know, so the molders for me is very mysterious, actually. It requires a degree in chemistry and mathematics and working through it to figure out what the different relationships are going to be. And every different formulation, one that's heavier on phosphorus than another bloom booster is, is going to have a different impact on the base nutrient. That's also why we suggest sticking with a line, not even necessarily our line, but if you grow with one line, find a trusted brand, you think that they care about you and they put a lot of thought into the formulations and not mix and match different brands unless you're a really experienced grower because you can mess all that up. Certainly. Well, yeah, I, uh, you know, definitely think this is a, a really great uh, overview here of, of the topic at hand today. Like I said, the white paper goes into even more specificity. Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us for today's presentation. Certainly want to thank Dan and Court and the whole Emerald Harvest team for the information. And uh, like I said, the link, uh, I know we're about to close out the webinar, but the link is in the chat. And if you miss it, on the homepage of CannabisBusinessTimes.com. So once again, both Court and Dan, thank you so much. This is great. Thank you for having us. Really, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been great. <laughs>